Welcome to the Global Investor Podcast, a show that focuses on helping foreign investors enter the lucrative U.S. real estate market. Host Charles Carrillo combines decades of real estate investing experience with a professional background in international banking to interview experts in all areas of U.S. real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Charles Carrillo. Do you have money sitting in the stock market and you're worried about it? Or worse, you have money sitting at the bank, not keeping up with inflation? My name is Charles Carrillo, founder and managing partner of Harborside Partners. And since 2006, I've been investing my money and my family's money into income producing properties. These are real assets, real properties with real addresses that produce real cash flow. At Harborside Partners, we provide passive investors who love real estate with a turnkey investing solution. If you wanna put your money to work in real estate but can't find deals, don't have the time to get funding, and the last thing that productive people want to do is manage real estate. We find the deals, we fund the deals, and we manage the tenants, the termites, and the properties. Partner with us at investwithharborside.com. That's investwithharborside.com. Go to investwithharborside.com. If you love real estate, you like the idea of passive income, and believe that income-producing properties will appreciate over time, go to investwithharborside.com. That's investwithharborside.com. Welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Crillo. Today we have George Bravanti. Beginning in the early 1990s, he started with a small vineyard and winery in the Napa Valley of California. Over the past 20 years, Bravanti Farm Capital has acquired over $175 million in agricultural assets, including citrus, table grapes, wine grapes, stone fruit, and pistachios. Prior to founding Bravante Farm Capital, he spent 10 years in the real estate private equity business, overseeing over $15 billion in real estate transactions. So thank you so much for coming on today, George. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So you have a very interesting uh, background. Can you give us a little bit about your background, both personally and professionally, prior to getting involved in your current farming business? Sure. Um, I grew up in the New York area, and uh, my dad was a mailman, and my mom was a teacher. And... Uh, Went to the University of South Carolina out of high school and uh, hardship. It's the cheapest school in the country. That's why I went there. Very, very, very tough criteria. Um, studied accounting there and graduated, went to work for Pete Marwick, one of the big eight firms. And then after a year there, I didn't like it. I moved to a firm, to Ernst & Young, which was Ernst & Winnie at the time. And we uh, they were starting a real estate practice in Newport Beach, California. So that's a pretty great place. And I went out there and took a look at it and packed my stuff in the car and drove out there. And that's sake, you know, I, I, we built a big real estate practice over three years. And then I left and became the CFO for the real estate arm of the Robert M. Bass Group out of Fort Worth. There's a billionaire brothers. And anyway, luck, luck, lucky enough to meet them and work for them. And, you know, that's where this big number of apartments, you know, we, we were in the early stages of the RTC kind of when American savings was the biggest failure in history in the eighties. And we bought that from the government and I ran the bad bank there. Wow. So it was 20 billion of assets, a big chunk of apartments, but it was every state in the union, but Alaska, really great experience, it was very mm -hmm. lucrative transaction. Then we formed colony capital after that. I president of colony for a while. And then I started having children and said, no way, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not, because these are global businesses. Yeah. So when you're, you know, I'm a young guy, it's pretty cool. But when you have a family, it's not so cool being gone all the time and form my own business. And it was real estate to begin with. And the family I partnered with had been in the ag space for a hundred years. And they had a couple of broken assets in the Central Valley and deal junkie George Bravante took a look at it. And we bought them really cheap. And that was the first inkling about the ag space. And I just took it from there and bought another ranch, another ranch, another ranch, built a packing house, a sales company, farming company, wow. cold storage. And, you know, and, and we've done a lot of transactions since then. And here we are. And, and now what we're doing is, you know, really great transactions are hard to find in the areas that we would only want to do them. We have this thing we call the oasis. And that's the Fresno area, basically, where all the groundwater emanates to. Okay. So, you know, if you look at the Sierras, they, there's always snow in the Sierras. It always creates runoff. So this area, the small area that we're focused on is a place where the water is plentiful, both surface water, which is irrigation districts coming out of the mountains, and groundwater. Also amazing microclimate, soil conditions also. So, you know, we're not going to do a lot of transactions, but, you know, this, I, so we started this crowdfunding idea about a year ago, 
We bought about $20 million of the assets in the last eight, nine months. All really good. And, and so we're going to do two or three transactions a year, probably, because that's all we can find that, that makes sense. I mean, I don't need to do this anymore. I like doing it, but it's my passion to do this. So anyway, so that's what we're doing. And it's, uh, you know, that's the history of it. George, can you give us a little background kind of of what your business looks like now? I know there's a number of different divisions when I was doing research this episode, and I was looking at one part and it said you had 14 different grape varieties. And there, it's, there's, there's a lot of different products that you're offering and a lot of different divisions that you have of your company. Can you kind of give us a little overview of what it is now? So, so basically, Bravante Produce is the mothership, and that employs all the people. And inside of Bravante, we have a sales company, and we have a farming company. And we have the packing house, cold storage. They're all three tenants of, of Bravante Produce. Outside of that, we have all these single purpose entities that own all the ranches where we grow citrus being oranges, lemons, mandarins, palm, you know, grapefruit, you know, caracara navels. We grow all the varieties of citrus. We have pistachios. We have about 400 acres of pistachios. We have about, we only have a small amount of stone fruit being traditional stone fruit, being peaches and plums, about 50 acres. And then we have about 300 acres of cherries, which is like going to Vegas <laughs> these days. Some people aren't planting more cherries. And then we have a very big table grape program, about the same size. So our citrus is a couple thousand acres, and our, our table grapes are about a couple thousand acres. And inside the, the table grape thing, we have you know early, mid, and late season, and we have green, blacks, and reds you know, late, early, and, you know, and in, 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 in the middle. And we have about 17 acres of grapes, varieties of grapes that we grow. And it's funny because, you know, every, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy business in a sense. Everybody wants the new variety. Every retailer wants the new cool variety. So we're always trying new things and moving on. But we, we have a significant, I mean, we, and we sell, you know, Sam's Club, Costco, you know, Kroger, you know, every, you, know, you name the retailers, we sell most of them. And oh. we also export 30 or 40% to Asia Interesting. of all these things we do. So, you know, it's, it's a little tougher market right now because inflation's high. So our inputs are high, but you know, the, the, the sales prices haven't come up quite as fast. We're lagging a little bit. So it's, it's a little tougher right now, but we're in all good water areas. Crops we grow are phenomenal. Yeah, we're slow. We're a smaller company. We we do, you know, three million boxes of fruit a year. We we make, pack, pick, and ship here. That's small, medium though. Mm -hmm. The bigger guys are ten million or more. You know what I mean? So we're a smaller, family-owned, kind of more boutiquey deal. Like our, we have a we have a small winery in Napa. We did early as something that was like something we have said. You know, my wife and I we got married, had a child, and, and built a winery all in one year. You know, and we we had no intention of ever having a winery either, right? We just did it because it, it, Napa is such a wonderful place. And you know, after that American Savings deal, I had I made some money in that deal, so I said, hey, "Let's buy let's buy this and build it and do it." And we did it, and we've had nice. it ever since. So and we make really really nice Bordeaux varietal wines, you know, Cabernet Merlot, you know, blends. And it's only two thousand cases a year. It's a small winery bit thing, but it's it's a great great thing also. Oh, well, that's so fantastic. Anyway. I have uh, uh, some of my good family friends. They spend uh, the summer in Napa, so I've been out there many of times. And uh, I'll have to look you up next time we're out. What there. part? Of, what part of Napa are they in? Uh, they go back between Sonoma, and then they were in Napa, and they're like in the downtown, um, the downtown area. It's like walking oh. from the downtown. Area. Oh yeah, that's yes. so nice. Now we yeah. moved there in, in the early '90s. It was a war zone down there. It's the <laughs> Renaissance has been amazing now down Napa. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's crazy. It's a they love it. It's a very, I mean, the climate's fantastic, especially coming from South Florida during that, during the summer. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a great getting a difference, but um, George, I want to talk about like, you You know, you're talking about getting deals on the, on these different, um, on these different parcels of land. And can you let us know kind of what is entailed in value add farmland investing? Like what you're doing, what you see as the future well, uh, value listen, of it? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're here trying to sell people to come invest with us, right? That's what, that's why I'm here. Yeah. So we have a transaction right now that's live. It's almost fully subscribed. So we're almost done with it. But it's a great example of what we're what we're doing. So mm -hmm. it's two parcels. One's 100 acres. One's 40. The 100 acres was this. It was a crazy labor contractor guy who would just, you know, people would owe him money and he just foreclose on him. 
And they had, and then, and then every job he was on, he'd steal a couple of trees and plant it in the hundred acres. So it was a hodgepodge, total horrible property in a really great place, right? The other one was a, a was a pasture land that was basically owned and operated by people making methamphetamine, wow. right? So two crazy situations. We bought both of them pretty cheap, and we from the ground up we rebuilt them. So the value add was low producing. Great land with great water with great soil, both places. Great, you know. We and we 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 and we don't do anything that's not within thirty minutes of our of my office. We you know we generally don't do that, right? I mean, we have one big ranch about an hour away, but it's thirteen hundred acres, so we, it's like a, a mothership unto its own. But this this transaction we're doing now, so the hundred acres is Mandarin citrus, like the cuties. It goes to cuties brand. We have a relationship with those guys. They're the best. They make the most money. So that's why we're with them. And it's got lemons and cara cara navels, which I don't know if you've ever eaten caras before, but that's like a new thing kind of last five, six years. It's like a pink orange. And it's more aromatic, it's super popular, wow. really good actually. And then the other, the 40 acres is this great, this green grape called great green, which is most one of the most popular grapes around. We make, and we make quite a bit of money with that too. So this is clean sheet. Uh, we took the ground down to the ground. We we prepped the land perfectly, planted the best crop. Like, the, like we picked the right trellis for the right variety, things people don't do all the time. So anyway, so we've got those. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna close in the end of May, I think, this year. We're about we're about done raising the money. We have a little bit to go. And it's about a 17 IRR over 10 years. So, you know, I mean, it could be, it could be way better than that, depending on the residual value. We're, we're pretty conservative on this. Like inflation's running 7%, we're at 2% in our pro forma stuff. We're trying to make it so it's totally attainable. We don't want to sell people stuff that will work. Right. So, I mean, that's what we think of value add. And there's, there's different versions of value add. You could have a ranch that's half really good and half really bad, and you buy it and you fix the other half that's bad, yeah. right? The other value add that we offer is, you know, you can't buy ag from most families because they just borrow the money and do it themselves because they're giant and they've been doing it for a hundred years. You know, we have, I've always had partners. I was a poor kid growing up. I had no money. I always need the partners to help me get there. So, you know, we're very fond of partners and we like that environment. And I, I put up 10 or 15% of all the money in every deal we do or more, depending on how much where I'm at that, that, that moment in time. So, you know, we're really good partners. We're really good fiduciaries. You know, we take, my wife bitches and moans all the time about, we take better care of our partner's money than our own, you know, because <laughs> it's important to me. I mean, growing up like I did, you know, my, my parent, my, you know, we're Italian family, you know, we, we are very serious about making sure we take care of our partners and freedom right. And I mean, probably too right in a way. So anyway, so that's kind of what we do. And that's, that's a really good example of what we're trying to do. And when, and when you build these things with the right varieties, the right root stock, the right water, I mean, your chances of success are so much higher. Mm -hmm. You know, early on, I bought ranches early on and they had a bunch of crap on them and we did okay. But when I, when I, when I redid the ranches, I mean, we went like 10 X on the, on revenue. I mean, it's so it's, it's, you know, it's big changes when you have really good versus okay, which right. sounds funny probably, but. No, no, it makes, anyway, makes that's how sense. That's how, that's how it works. So tell us about, I mean, if um, with vertically being vertically integrated in farming, how does that, I, we have a lot of people on here to talk about vertically integrated and multifamily, which is, you know, we know how that goes, but it like, tell us about like farmland. What, what are you doing? Maybe that your competitors or the farms that you're buying don't have in place. And that's why you're adding a lot of value to it as well. I think, I mean, this is, it's, people will think this is very strange, but you know, the average farmer in this valley, this valley's giant, right? I mean, 50% of all the food in America comes from here, and we export a third of it, right? So, I mean, it's massive, right? And, I mean, it, I mean, the average farm is 40 acres still. So, guys like me and guys bigger than me are, 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 are kind of like you know, gobbling this stuff up and making bigger things because you need to be more efficient today. Mm -hmm. But in citrus, I think the average citrus grower is 40 acres. And what that guy will do, so like say you had a listener who's, who got inspired by what I'm telling him today, right? And said, I don't need George Bravani though. I'm going to go do it myself. I'm going to call a broker. I'm going to call a broker. 
and I'm going to do this. He calls a broker. He finds a 40 acre piece. Doesn't know what he's got. Probably they'll tell him what it is. Might not be what it is. He won't understand how to test the soil, how to test the water. I mean, they'll tell him kind of what to do, but it's a crapshoot, right? Then he's got to find a guy to farm it for him. And that guy will charge him twice as much as I'm charging our people. Because I charge everybody the same. I mean, it's a, it's a market below market, probably a below market number. Because if, if you're a little farming company, you got to make money, right? I mean, you know, you don't have a scale to pass all this stuff over. So you're paying too much for the farming, right? Then that guy's got a buddy at a packing house and says, hey, I'll, I got a guy that'll take your fruit, right? He'll pack it for you. And they'll, you know, and they'll, they'll do okay, but they won't pick it at their exact right moment. They won't, they won't make sure it's going to the right buyer. They, they'll just pack it. So you're losing money there too, right? So, I mean, those two things are massive numbers though in the, in the scale of what we do. I mean, we're, I mean, it, I mean, let's say we're averaging $18 a box this year on navel oranges. That guy could be anywhere from 14 to 20, depending on who he's with, what he is. So it's vertical in that we can offer and I'm not even talking about the stuff we can offer cheaper. Like we buy a million boxes, so we get them a little bit cheaper. The, the commercial packing house isn't going to give you that discount. They're going to keep that for themselves. So, you know what I mean? It's it's yeah. kind of economies of scale as well as there's no middlemen making money. You know, we make it one at one one place total. And, and, and we don't make that much money packing anyway. George Bravani makes all his money at the farm level. You know, we drive all the value to the farm and then that falls out the bottom of the, you know, how we, how much money we make that year. That's how I make money. Because I mean, packing fruit is not a way to make money. Because, I mean, we keep, if I make 500 grand this year in our packing house, I'm going to spend 700 buying new equipment. I mean, it's just kind of how it works. So, but I mean, it's, it's a great tool though. I mean, like we, we spent 400,000 a couple of years ago to put high bricks detection in. With, so, I mean, every orange or carrot that goes over our line, we know how much sugar is in each orange. So in Korea and, and Vietnam pay more for high bricks fruit. I mean, no house our size even has that. You know what I mean? But our sales team uses that to make another dollar or two a box, which doesn't sound like much, but when you do a million boxes, it's a lot. So, so that's kind of how I think about why we've done what we've done, why we spent all this money building this place and, you know, all that. Yeah. So it, it, you make you do better for sure. Yeah, yeah. I like the uh, the one of the first things you said was uh, it was around having more control and picking at the right time, and that's kind of I think the main thing about most vertical integrated firms uh, and any part of real estate is just more control over the whole situation. And you know, big private equity firm if they had man their own property management, they're not going to make more money. You know, like you said, they're it's not going to be that much more money on doing the property management, but it's more control over the whole thing and getting that extra well, like a little bit to out. Take that, yeah. To take that thought one step further, right? Let's say my farmer example of they didn't pick, it was supposed to be picked. It's an at, let's say it's an at, at wood orange, right? That's got to go in January. You got to get atwoods off in January, maybe early February, right? A lot of guys will wait, they won't get to it till March, right? So when you pick, when we, we pick stuff into a bin, you know, 950 pounds of fruit in a, in a urethane container, basically. That's how we pick and transport fruit, right? We're trying to get 21 cartons out of that bin, packed and shipped, right? And, and we do that regularly, right? If, if you wait till March on that example, they're going to get 15. Hmm. Because the first is going to be soft, pliable, you know what I mean? So just think about it, $20 a box, you know, 15 times 20 is 300, you know? The other thing is like 450. I mean, that's a huge delta, right? So utilization is so critical to this to this vertical integration that we do. We spend all of our time trying to make sure we sequence the fruits so we get the most box packages per box or per bin sold into the market. Sounds simple. It's really hard to do it really great. <laughs> I would imagine so. It sounds. It doesn't really sound that simple. It sounds like it's a lot of work to uh, maintain everything between everything from you know from vine all the way to sale. You know what I mean? To um, anyway, it's a, but I mean it makes a difference. How does your company like yours? I mean, protect your downside risk. I mean, environmental risk. Uh, obviously, where you're located, it minimizes some of that. But how do you kind of protect yourself against uh, any other environmental risk that could damage your crops? Well, first of all, we have we take the maximum crop insurance and everything we have. 
sort of federally sponsored crop insurance on everything. And basically what that does, it protects you, like all your inputs for the year are covered by that. So if you had a wipeout year, like it rained, like hail wiped out your crop, you get all your farming back and start and try it again next year. Big, that's a big thing because, you know, without that, it'd be super risky, right? And, and the Fed has figured out it's better to subsidize a little bit each year than have a national disaster one year, and then they pay all the money in the universe in, and they, it's really a bad deal. So that works really good. Um, we, have a, we have a lot of water, which mitigates a lot of the problems other people are having. You don't have a lot of water, right? I mean, we only buy where there's a lot of water. So when, when it gets really hot, you know, we can dump the water on and, and the trees aren't stressed and they're fine. So, I mean, it's things like that in the area we're in. It's, it's, a, it's a critical, I mean, I wouldn't want to try to do this in other places if people are doing it. So yeah. the, your odds are not that great. So George, what would you say is some of the top reasons why investors would need or should have farmland in their portfolio? I mean, I, you know, like I'm all in on ag, right? I mean, I used to be, I, I'm, I'm not a believer in the stock market personally. I grew up in New York around the penny stock craze. And half of my friends were crooks that were doing it. It seemed like to me. And I just have a, I just never have done it. We've done hard money lending and stuff like that, but we've never been the stock market. So I'm not, I just don't understand that why people would want to buy air. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, 50 times earnings. I just don't get that. Yeah. But I would say, you know, what, what happens in my experience, and if you look at history, these assets, the good ones, like we're going to do, appreciate two to 3% a year forever. It's what happens, it's going to continue to happen, right? And then, you know, we sell stuff a dollar at a time, right? You go to the store, you buy an orange, it's 50 cents, right? We pick fruit, put it in a box, ship it to the market. I mean, people are buying more and more fruit and less and less junk all the time as the millennials grow up. And I mean, it's, it's a growth market. Worldwide, you know, supply is shrinking every day. So, you know, I think it's a safe place to be. Like, you know, I'm not cheering for, for a recession. We do better in recessions because people don't go out to eat during recessions. They go to the store. So if you look at our business over the last 20 years, when you have a little tougher environmental stuff, we did better. So, you know, and I, and I don't think people should dump tons of money into ag, but I think in what, we're, what we're offering, I mean, I would, I mean, I got a lot of my very close friends that are doing this with me because they've seen what I've done over the last 30 years. And they want a little exposure to it, you know, not a lot, but they want, you know, they're putting hundred grand in or something, they're maybe worth 5 million or something like that. So I, I think people, I mean, it's safe, it's predictable. And then you're making your, I mean, you're making two, 3% a year and you're going to make, I don't know, five, 6% minimum on your cash flow. You know, it's, it, it's, there's, there's huge depreciation benefits in this. So you, you shelter your income the first four or five years as we go. And then you recapture later at cap gains rates. So it's pretty efficient. And then we're in this thing called the Williamson Act, where property taxes are real low on ag land. So you get a benefit there. So, I mean, it's a, it's a very safe growth industry because people are going to keep eating this stuff forever. And the better, I mean, we're in one of the best places on earth to do it, just, you know, climatically and soil-wise. So that's why I would do it. George, you mentioned cash flow. What is something, when does cash flow normally start on one of your deals? Now, obviously, it can differ deal to deal and some are at different stages, but what does it usually start time wise from someone time they invest till time they get a distribution? It, it, it depends on what we're buying, right? So, this new program we're doing, we've done three, we've done about 20 million, right? We've done three deals. If you count the one we're about to close, mm -hmm. they're starting in year one or two because all of these things are mature. Right. And it grows a little bit because there's invariably there's a block we need to replace or it's young and not producing yet. But, you know, it, it kind of it's like seven to 10 percent moving up kind of. If you, if you look at the first 20 million, it, it's, it's immediate return, basically, in, in, you know, in the 14 months after we close will be the first distribution of about seven to 10 percent, probably. Okay. So, I mean, but but I mean, as we go forward. That's why I'm encouraging people on this last deal we have because it's it's fully done, ready to go. It's making money a little bit. It's going to get better and better over the next couple of years. You know, we got to go build it now. It's going to be tougher. It's going to be like four years before you get cash flow, which I'm not sure how the. It's going to be harder to find people that. I mean, you, you get a better product at the end, and it's pretty good execution. But still, people want money quicker than that generally. Yeah. So, but the ones we're doing now are pretty immediate. 
Okay. Interesting. So over the years of your working career, what have you found, um, or even since you started your farm business, what have you found to be your biggest challenge? Yeah, this will sound strange, but, you know, one thing I, you know, I'm, I'm a guy who believes, you know, I don't need to do everything. There's, there's people that are better than me at everything. Right. And I get this ag space and I'm hiring these theoretical experts to do a lot of different things. In our last 30 years, I fired all of them. I've done it all myself and my own people because we never came out with the experts because they were working for themselves. They had other clients. They were not as capable as they said they were. They didn't care as much. So the biggest learning curve, you know, I just don't think I can do it better than the expert, right? I just, I'm, I'm, I, went, I mean, I'm a confident guy, but it's the weirdest thing, right? Because I just I figured out we can do it better than everybody else just like the other guys have figured out over their careers. And, you know, I always, I always thought people are a lot of little insular, you know what I mean? Like, why are they that way? Why are they using? And the reason is because you do better. So that's been a huge, huge learning curve for me to adapt to using our own people, hiring the best, but they have to work for you where they where you control their day-to-day -day activities and they're all in on making you more successful as a company. So anyway, that's a, that's been a big, Big thing for me. Great answer. So, George, how has uh, your relationship towards money changed over the years from starting from uh, not so much money to, you know, all the properties and all the land that you guys have now? You know, I, I have three sons that are wonderful, great, really successful, great kids, 20, 29, 27, 25. Great, you know, and, I, and I've been I think I've been smart enough in my life. I told them from the beginning, it doesn't matter. The money's not important. It's the ride. You know, you got to enjoy what you got to do. You got to have great relationships with people. You got to enjoy. And I've been lucky. I met some of the most interesting people on earth, in my private equity days. And, you know, I just, and, 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 and also the idea of, you know, I'd rather make less doing it my way. So, you know, and I mean, you know, I, I was a poor kid, hungry. I wanted to make money. I mean, that was my main thing. I was a paper boy when I was a little kid. And the people where I grew up still remember me as this little kid saying, I'm going to be a player someday. And they didn't know what that meant. <laughs> you know, and I was five years old. So, you know, so I was a hungry, wanted to make money kind of kid. And, you know, and I, and I was very lucky, made some money early in my, and, you know, and I, my family was much more driven by doing the right thing, being a good person and being happy. And I've always been that way. You know what I mean? I, I, I'm, I don't want to go out of business. So I'm, I'm focused. But I'm, I, money is not that important to me. You know, what I do is really important to me. But, you know, the money comes if you do a good job. And and and, and my wife and I and our family, we're not consumers of giant amounts of money. You know, we don't need, you know what I mean? We just have a normal life and, you know, and we we do nice things. We go to nice places and stuff once in a while. But, you know, we're much more, you know, we're the million, you ever read the book, The Millionaire Next Door? You know, yeah. the, the guy next door looks like yeah. he's. I mean, I wear the same jeans every day. People at the at the McDonald's think I'm some bag man, you know. What I mean, so it's I mean, it's different that way. Uh, it's such a great book, great pull. That well, like 20, 30 years old. That's a fantastic yeah. book. My dad gave it to me when I was when I was young. Um, but very interesting and very true. Uh, older I get, the more I learn that's true. But um, so, George, how can our listeners learn more about you, your business, and your offerings? Yeah, I mean, we have a really good website that we've worked on really hard. It's BravantePharmCapital.com. And we put, we've done, spent a lot of time explaining in video form what we do, right? And, and if you sign up for it, you know, you're not signing up to buy anything. You're signing up to get our information. Also, there are some really great testimonials in there for friends of mine and associates of mine have invested with me from... One guy is a, was a chairman of Air, American Airlines, the most successful guy in the world. I mean, and how he and I got together. I mean, it's, if people want to know kind of about us, those testimonials are great because they're from the heart, from guys that just didn't know anything about me or what we do and have been investing for 10 years with us and how they, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And then we have a lot of stuff about what stuff means. You know, like for instance, ranches don't trade on cap rates. They trade by the acre. That's why the values are low, lower than they should be. I mean, on mandarins, you know, the QD stuff, I mean, that stuff, I mean, we're, that stuff's trading at 40, 50,000 an acre. At an eight cap rate, it'd be 200,000 an acre. 
right? Yeah. People would never pay that because they're, they're conditioned that cap rates don't matter. Very predictable too. It's every year you're making good money on that stuff. So we have a whole section on this on our website about how why that is. Awesome. Well, um, thank you so much. I was on your website for about an hour yesterday preparing for this episode. So it was, there's a lot of information on there and a lot of terms that I wasn't uh, aware of or familiar with. Um, I was able to get cleared up. So anybody that's really interested at all with learning more about ag farmland, definitely go over to his website. And I want to thank you so much for coming on today, George. Hey, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day. All right. See ya. Hi guys, it's Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in getting involved with real estate, but you don't know where to begin, set up a free 30-minute strategy call with me at ScheduleCharles.com. That's ScheduleCharles.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Global Investor Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new weekly episodes. For more resources and to receive our newsletter, please visit globalinvestorpodcast.com. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Syndication Superstars, LLC, exclusively.